So um, feel free, folks who are watching, to ask questions. And Mark and Tom, stop me at any time to ask questions as well. But what I want to talk about for folks right now is adolescent brain development and addiction. Because as Tom says, you know, there is potential boredom here. Um, kids who are used to being at school, used to being social, used to being with each other, are cooped up at home for their own safety. This is not a punishment. How many times have kids been grounded because they've done something wrong? This is the problem. They have done nothing wrong, but there may still be that free association with, if I'm cooped up, I've done something wrong. Kids, if you're listening, you haven't done anything wrong. All we're trying to do is save some lives here. So let me teach you a little bit about this adolescent brain development and addiction. All right, now if I can figure out how to, Oh, you know what? You have you have the screen, so you should be able to control whatever you do. We'll see from now on. Okay, but the thing is, how do I? There we go. All right. Can you see that? One in yes. five. Wow. Fifty million children. You see that? And one in five kids have some sort of psychiatric condition. That can be anxiety. It can be depression. It can be attention deficit. It can be bipolar, it can be all sorts of different things, but look at this number here, folks. Two million kids meet the criteria for addiction. What's the criteria for addiction? It's not just a little bit of use in here and there, it's dependency. It's saying, if I don't have this drug, something will happen to me and I need to get it. Two million kids. I just want you guys to understand that number. And the thing is, it's a big number already. I do not want that number to increase. But we are at risk of it increasing right now unless we recognize just the simple fact of the way adolescent brain develops. I don't want to scare anybody. I just want people to learn and understand so that we can think things through. The other thing you need to know is there are 2 million kids that meet this criteria for addiction that's not as many kids who suffer from some sort of psychiatric condition. And you notice I'm not using the word disorder. I don't believe in disorders, that's an I am. Everything's a condition. There are about 9,000 child psychiatrists in the United States. So folks, if anybody is interested in having a good job when you grow older, become a child psychiatrist because there are people who need you. Two million kids, criteria for addiction. All right. You guys remember this? Everybody do me a favor who is listening or watching, just look at your index finger. Look at your index finger, thank you, Tom, and close one eye and go back and forth. Open, close, open, close. What do you notice, Tom? Oh, it's moving. That's funny. Right. What is this witchcraft? It's, <laughs> <laughs> it's moving because each of your eyes has a slightly different geographic location in the world, a slightly different perspective. And there are billions of perspectives in the world, each one as interesting as the next. Right now, many of us share the same perspective. We are fearing COVID. We are fearing coronavirus. We share a perspective right now. It's important what we do with it, but this shows how much in common we have. How do we get someone to share their perspective with us? So folks in the audience, close both eyes and count to three. Okay, so that's trust. Because, you know, even though I'm not in the room, you know, if I was in the room and I give this lecture to, you know, hundreds and hundreds of people at a time, I say, you know, that's trust because you don't know I'm not going to jump off the podium and start, you know, splacking you around. So how do we get someone to trust us? We have to be able to get them to trust us with their perspective. The reason people don't come for treatment is because of stigma. It's a major reason. Stigma is a perspective that somebody is bad, that they're weak, that they're corrupt, that there's something wrong with them. But as you're gonna learn tonight, addiction is not about that. It's a brain thing. Addiction is not about morality. It's about mortality. It's just the way the brain works. And that's what I'm gonna teach you guys a little bit about tonight. Addiction is not about morality. It's about mortality. So let's learn a bit about the adolescent brain. What do kids want? To be social, take risks, feel pleasure. It's a setup for addiction. I mean, we've all been adolescents. We all know what it is. 
to want to be social, take risks and feel pleasure. And luckily, not all of us have gone on to become addicted to drugs, but this is part of why kids are at such risk because their brains are developing in such a way that it is a setup for addiction. Here are the numbers. You start using drugs or alcohol after the age of 21, one out of 25 people can become addicted. That's four in a hundred. You start using after the age of 21, four out of every hundred people can become addicted. But if you start using before the age of 18, number goes from one in 25 to, you wanna guess? I know you know it because I told you, but what's the guess? What would you drink think if you didn't know the number? What would you let say? Hang. Let's let it hang there. Let's think about this for a second. Let it hang because one in 25 is a lot anyhow. Yeah. Right. Well, so is it one in 15? Is it one in 10? I mean, these well, are well, one, in, <laughs> one in eight. What right. is it, Dr. Joe? So we got, we got this two minute delay, but folks who are there, type it in. 20 Ask second. It. Wonder at 20 second delay. Yeah, Much let's talk. Well, let's talk about the twenty-second delay while we wait for them to. Okay. Tell me, to, episode one that we did on this, you talked about the twenty-second delay with respect to anxiety, right? Right. So let's go through that. So, just just real quick about anxiety, we have an opportunity to delay our response. It is important to be reflective and not reflexive. Delay the response you have. You're going to feel anxious. There's nothing wrong with anxiety. There's nothing wrong with anger, nothing wrong with sadness. It's what you do with it that's important. Those are limbic feelings. We're going to get into the limbic system tonight. But you get to think things through. Be reflective, not reflexive. Wonder instead of worry. Take those 20 seconds to just think it through. In the same way that right now we're being asked to take 20 seconds to wash our hands. While you're washing your hands, it's your opportunity to just sort of chill a bit and, and think and, and just enjoy those 20 seconds. This is part of getting back to what Mark was talking about at the beginning. We're slowing down a bit, not bad. It's kind of nice to slow down a bit. I mean, we're all running so fast. You run too fast, you don't get to see what's around you. So we're all slowing down. I'm gonna go to this. That number goes from one in 25 Anybody else guessing? Hold on, let me look on Facebook. Stand okay. On. Guess Bonsai. here. Hold on. Drum okay. Roll. Drum roll. Drum roll. We've got some guesses. We got some guesses. Betting ends. We got one in 10. Yeah. We got 20 out of 25. Okay. Five out of 10. People okay. aren't paying attention, but we'll, we'll work on math tomorrow with Mathnasium. Here's the one number. Nine. We got yeah. one in nine, and we have the drum roll. The winner, Damn. Brett Weinroth, knew it. One in four. He's watching. Brett's paying attention, ladies and gentlemen. Think about uh, your. So what you're telling us, Doctor Joe, is that if you were to wait until you were 21, as opposed to experimenting before you're 18, you're yep. saying that the difference for a potential lifelong addiction is from one in 25 to one in four. One in four. That's amazing. Yeah, it's a wow number. It it's is. a wow number. And, and this is, um, is right out of the CASA study out of Columbia University. We've known this since 2010. Wow. Right? We've known this for 10 years that this is the number. So what do we and, do with this? And well, we, we need to understand it. We need to ask, well, why? Why is this so much more insidious and dangerous if you're a kid? I mean, you know, you probably have lots of friends who, you know, smoked weed or drank something in high school, maybe did more. Certainly not all of them went on to be addicted, but I want you to really think about it for a moment. I want you to really think about those people in your life and some of them got addicted, I bet. And if you really think about it, whoa, maybe, maybe one in four of them did get addicted for life. Right, right. I mean, I, I must admit, I've, I've had friends who uh, passed away in college, overdosed in college. It was way back in the mid-1970s. 
they were using back then, people are still using now, and certainly not everybody. Not everyone's gonna get addicted for life, but I don't know which one, and they don't know which one. None of us know. So all we're asking kids to do is wait. Wait until you're older. So I want you to understand this connection. What is going on in that brain? So this is an illustration that my daughter Sophie did uh, for one of my books called Outsmarting Anger. Seven Ways to Diffuse Our Most Dangerous Emotion. This book actually, I'm proud to say, went on to win the award in 2013 for the best psychology book for Books for a Better Life. And it was because it was looking at anger differently. It was looking at anger as an emotion that is designed to change a behavior. We get angry when we want somebody to do something different, start doing something, stop doing something. But the book won an award because it was based on a simple question. When's the last time you got angry at someone treating you with respect? You don't. So respect becomes a behavior to change an emotion. Now that's not what we're gonna be talking about tonight. But I wanted to sort of lay the foundation that maybe we want to come back and talk about that later on at another Dr. Joe show, because there's probably going to be a lot of anger out there in the world as well. Mm -hmm. So here's the brain. The brain is like a three scoop ice cream cone. This idea was first uh, presented by David Levine in a book called The Accidental Mind, which is a great book if you guys want to read it. But I just want to give credit where credit is due. He came up with the idea of using the metaphor of a three scoop ice cream cone. So spinal cord is the ice cream cone. Brain stem is that first scoop. The limbic system is that second scoop. And then on top of it is the cerebral cortex, third scoop of ice cream. This is a little out of scale. It really should be backwards so that the biggest scoop is the top one. But here's what it really looks like. Here's what the brain looks like. And you guys can, I think, appreciate where that brain stem is, where that limbic system is, and then that sort of wavy part is all prefrontal, is called neocortex, the, the new, new part brain. of the brain. The new brain, neo, new cortex brain. You see that white band in the middle there? That white band is really the part that is distinguishing sort of the top of the limbic system and those round things beneath it is limbic. And then it goes down into that lumpy thing with what looks like a throat almost, a big piece of you know, bulbous thing. That's brainstem, okay? And this is a fancy way of looking at what's called differential myelination. It's a fancy way of saying maturation. So brain is made up of nerve cells, brain cells. And these brain cells conduct electricity from one end to the other, just like a piece of wire. But in order for that wire to conduct the electricity efficiently, it's got to have an insulation around it. That insulation, that rubbery sheath is called myelin. And the brain has this myelin sheath around it, around those neurons, so that it can transmit its electrical charge from one place to another efficiently. You guys may know people who have multiple sclerosis. Mm -hmm. Multiple sclerosis is when the immune system attacks that myelin and kills it. And so those brain cells can't conduct their charge. And so parts of the body of the person that is meant to be controlled by those brain cells can stop working. It can become, they can have blindness, they can have paralysis. Eventually, it can stop the brain cells that are meant to control your breathing. So, you've all seen babies. Babies are squirming around, but they're not slam dunking basketballs because at the very top of the brain is the motor cortex, the part of the brain that's controlling how we move our bodies that part of the brain is partially myelinated, partially mature at birth. But as it gets older, it becomes more and more mature. And then kids who are good at basketball can slam dunk basketballs. So we're gonna look at the limbic system. The brain stem is responsible for 
heart rate, for everything automatic. But this limbic system is responsible for feelings, impulses, pleasure. It actually should be memories in there as well. And it's also where addictions start. And we're gonna get into this other thing called dopamine. So limbic system, responsible for feelings, impulses, pleasure, memory, addictions. It is the impulsive, irrational part of our brain. It is about here and now. It's about pleasure. I've heard it called now, the reptile brain, is that right? It is absolutely right, Tom. It is the reptilian brain because this brain is billions and billions of years old. As we were maturing, we never threw any part of our brain a ball. We just built one chunk of brain on top of the other. So we started with this limbic system that then built the neocortex on top of that. Before that was the brain stem that was just controlling things that we didn't even think about. And then there's the new brain, the neocortex, in particular, that part right behind your forehead, the frontal lobe, and in particular, the prefrontal cortex, right in front of the frontal lobe, responsible for thinking, solving problems, taking action, anticipating the consequence of those actions. It's also something responsible for theory of mind, which we'll talk about at another time. And it also has a lot to do with oxytocin another chemical that we're going to talk about. So let me stop there. Any questions so far from anybody? I'll take a little pause. We'll think about questions because these are major, major parts of our brain. You know, I'll admit I've, I've sort of distilled it down. It's a bit more complicated, but really these are the parts of the brain that we are really interested in when it comes to addiction. The limbic system, and the frontal lobes. This is my first time hearing about myelin. But, uh, that's interesting to me. So it's, is this a good metaphor? Uh, imagine like an egg cooking, like as parts of the egg solidify, that would be the myelin making things work. It's it's a pretty good idea. But but again, I, I, I want you to think about how how do we sort of add one layer upon layer upon layer of something? Um, so an egg cooking is, is one way to think about it. Another way to think about it, like I said, is being able to take a wire and having it work better. Mm. So, you know, with electricity, a wire doesn't work very well unless you've really got something that helps that charge stay in it. Another sort of analogy would be clothing. So if you're naked, you can be pretty cold. And it may immobilize you. You may not be able to do that much when you're that cold. But as you put one layer of clothing upon another, your body begins to warm up and you begin to have more activity and you can do more things. But that's what myelin is. Uh, it is based on some very interesting cells, which have a really cool name called oligodendrocytes. And that's in the central nervous system but the peripheral nerves where that spinal cord goes down to and like, in, you know, innervates the rest of our body so that our arms and legs can move and toes can wiggle and other things can do what they need to do. That also has myelin, but those are myelinated by Schwann cells. So these cells literally sit on top of the neuron and cover it. And that's what insulates it. And those are the cells that get killed off in things like multiple sclerosis. And the Schwann cells were discovered by Smith. No, I'm kidding, by Schwann. All right, I'm gonna go on. Dopamine. All drugs and alcohol force the brain to make dopamine. It is the simple, simple molecule. Really, I, I'm telling you guys, it is the simplest thing, okay? It's got this circle of carbon, it's got a couple of hydroxy groups stuck on top of them. That's the ho-ho. And it's got this NH2, right, which is an amine. That's an amine group. That's why it's called dopamine. It's an amine, a type of chemical that we all have that is the ancient chemical of pleasure. You can take a snail and you can chop it up and you can extract the chemicals, you'll get dopamine. Because the dopamine is what orients that snail to food and to light, the things that it needs in order to survive. Because 
pleasure is also part of survival. We wouldn't get addicted to drugs if we didn't feel pleasure. I mean, let's not be you know, silly about it. So you know, no one's gonna scare a kid out of using drugs because if the brain is gonna choose between fear and pleasure, it's gonna choose pleasure every time. That's why what Tom is talking about with the boredom is so important. Because when we get bored, we want to do something. We want to feel pleasure. We want to feel some excitement, especially for kid. Feel pleasure, take risks and be social. But this dopamine is pretty dangerous. It's a really selfish, selfish molecule. And all drugs force the brain to make this molecule, this ancient chemical of pleasure, that over time, we don't feel pleasure anymore. We just need to get more dopamine so we don't feel sick. That's what addiction is, and that's what dependence is. We use up so much dopamine, if we don't have it, we just feel sick and horrible and depleted. And so we use again to force our brain to make it. And what, what mechanism causes that? That, that sort of, uh, I guess, immunity to whatever you're taking? Oh, so what happens is that's called a dependency and a tolerance. So after a while, a lot of the drugs that we use uh, that are addictive actually affect the brain stem. And so because they're affecting the brain stem, if you overdose on them, you stop breathing. Because remember, the brain stem is responsible for breathing, for heart rate, things like that. And so after a while, you need so much dopamine to feel pleasure. But if you don't get it, you're going to go into withdrawal because all those brain cells that are used to getting dopamine are also saying, whoa, 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 wait a second. If I don't have this, I can't work. So we can overdose. Now, what's really interesting, because a lot of people don't think weed is addictive. I know we're going a little bit off base here, but weed is absolutely physiologically addictive. It just may not have receptor sites on the brain stem as far as we know. So people may not overdose, but that may not be the case because we actually have seen with edibles, you know, being able to eat weed, if you eat too much of it, people actually have been overdosing. So another discussion, another day. Why are we talking about this again in the middle of the coronavirus pandemic? Because kids are gonna be at home. Kids aren't gonna be at school. Kids are gonna get bored. Kids are at risk for using, maybe having a drink of alcohol from their parents' cabinet. Maybe, as Mark says, going into the medicine cabinet and finding a drug that, you know, maybe they used for, for a toothache years ago, like a Percocet or a, oxycodone. an oxycodone. So, folks, if you're listening, make sure that you've got those things under lock and key. All the alcohol and all those prescription pain medicines, dangerous stuff. So dopamine is affecting the limbic system. It's just like charging it up. And of course, if the limbic system is responsible for being impulsive, what's happening here? The dopamine is saying, hey, let's not think things through. Let's just be impulsive. Let's just be impulsive. So how do we know about all this stuff? Because years ago, people started looking, scientists started looking at the way the brain works. And they showed a bunch of adults a picture of a shark. All these adults were lying in an fMRI machine, a functional magnetic resonance imaging. So with that machine, we can actually take moving pictures of the brain and show what parts light up and what don't when it's stimulated. And so they showed him a picture of a shark. And they asked the adult, would you swim with a shark? And the adult said, no way, it's a shark. It's gonna bite me in half, you crazy? There's no way I'm gonna swim with a great white shark. And when they looked at the fMRI in the adult brain, the frontal lobe was lighting up like crazy. And especially the prefrontal cortex, that part of the brain responsible for thinking, solving, solving a problem, taking an action and anticipating what will happen next. And the adult brain was thinking rationally, if I swim with this shark, it will bite me in half. There's no way I am going to swim with it. Reasonable, right? rational. That's what the prefrontal cortex is about. It's about thinking things through. What will happen next? That's the part of the brain, like I say, when we're anxious, you put your hand on your forehead and you slow yourself down and think things through because that anxiety comes from the limbic system. 
emotions come from the limbic system. So you can put your hand on your forehead and just stop for a moment and think things through. So then these scientists show the exact same picture to a group of teenagers. Exact same picture. There are those teenagers in the fMRI machine. And they said, would you swim with this shark? And the teenager said, well. Am I in a cage? Maybe. I got this. I, I can got, take that shark. Yeah. If I, you know, if like, if, I, if the weather is nice, if the water is warm, if I got a new bathing suit, if I got a snorkel, if, if Jenny is there, I am so swimming with that shark. Ha, ha, ha. And when they looked at the fMRI in the teenager's brain, that limbic system was lighting up like crazy. That part of the brain responsible for feelings, impulses, pleasure, memory. They began to realize, oh my gosh, this is why kids are getting addicted. I swing at the shark, I'm gonna get laid. Yeah, that's exactly it, man. And that's a whole bunch of pleasure. Because the limbic system is more in control of the adolescent brain. That limbic system responsible for impulses, for pleasure, for memory. It's where addictions start. Kind of interesting, huh? So in other words, the brain matures following evolution. The brain matures from the bottom up. Brain stem has to be ready to go at birth. Babies that can't have functioning brain stems, that don't have functioning brain stems, they're not breathing, their heart rate isn't going, they're dying. And that evolutionary line stops. Babies who die do not go on to have more babies. And then the next part of the brain that we evolved was the limbic system. That reptilian brain, the lizard brain. And then the neocortex matures, becomes more and more myelinated. Just like that little baby that's not slam dunk in basketballs, but part of it's myelinated, becomes more and more mature. And that's when that adult brain begins to take over. So in other words, the reason why it's one in four, why one in four kids under the age of 18 can get addicted for life if they use drugs is because they're really not thinking about the future. And that limbic system is so eager. It just begins to take over. And that pleasure part just begins to take over. And those kids grow up, they're not thinking about the future anymore. They're just thinking about the immediate way of getting that next fix. How do I get that next fix? It's that three scoop ice cream cone. That's what's happening. The adolescent brain is a setup for addiction just because the way it's developing. Addiction is not about morality. It's about mortality. It's just the way the brain is.